Hi everyone, I am Dr. Mark Sklar, the fertility expert, and welcome back to Fertility TV. In this episode, as you can see, we've got an interview for all of you today, and I am super excited, and I think all of you are lucky and blessed to have Ann Margolis here with me today to talk about... <laughs> I'm blind. Um, ...home birth and birthing, um, the whole process of, of birthing, um, she is Anza, an amazing and well experienced and well versed um, midwife, and she brings that knowledge to all of you. Not only today, but if you um, take the steps, which you all should, to follow her, um, then you know she'll share that information with you on a regular basis. So, Anne, thank you so much for joining. I think this is a really important topic for my for my family of viewers, and uh, I'm excited to have you here with me today. Excited to be here. Awesome. So for everyone watching, you might be used to me always talking about fertility and preconception work and, and, and health and so forth, but I know because I get all these emails on a regular basis, which is awesome and, and, and super magical, um, that many of you are pregnant or about to be pregnant, hopefully for a lot of you. Um, and so I think I wanted to bring Anne here to talk with all of you and for us to have a conversation about birthing and pregnancy, because I think as you, you spend all this time gathering information about how to make yourself more fertile and how to become healthier to become fertile, which is awesome, super, super important. But we then, then what happens next? What happens once we're pregnant? Where do we go from here? And it's not like the work stops, right? Actually, you know, you're gonna, you're, you're hopefully about to be a parent, and that work never stops, as many of us can share with you. So, um, you know, it starts actually from the moment conception happens. In my mind, we're all parents at that moment, and we've got to act with full responsibility and full consciousness of, of being that parent for that child who can't make decisions yet on their own. And so, we've got this, you know, ten months of pregnancy and then into labor and delivery and beyond. And so I thought it was gonna be really, really important to bring Anne on here to, to share her knowledge and experience and wisdom with us, which is why I'm sharing that with all of you. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so that everyone stops hearing my voice and hears some of yours, um, <laughs> can you share a little bit about yourself? Um, tell everyone a little bit about you um, so they can um, understand more of, of your experience and who you are and, and why you're here today. Sure. Um, I went, you mean starting from like college? Whatever you want to share. Yeah, I, I, um, I went to um, University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. And mm -hmm. when I did my obstetric rotation, I knew right away that, that I, that's what I wanted to be involved with, helping women and, and families and babies. And um, I, when I graduated in those days, we had to do first a year of medicine and surgery. Mm -hmm. And then I worked in an obstetric unit. Now I was only, I mean, for, for several years. Um, and that's where I developed fear of birth. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh, you know, so it, you know, it, when I was at Penn and, and we learned about natural birth, we learned about it. We, uh, I wasn't seeing it. Right. And what I was seeing more was like, um, it was like a scene from, oh, you know, the ER. Birth was a crisis, a lawsuit waiting to happen. It was a disaster waiting to happen. And so there was, um, I never saw natural birth and I saw way too many um, cesareans. I was, I was um, the nurse assisting at a lot of cesareans. Um, and I, and I, I was witnessing and trying to rescue a lot of the problems from the cascade of interventions that go on in, in the hospital setting. And I felt like my hands were tied as a nurse, mm -hmm. right? And, and then around the same time, um, I was pregnant with my first baby. And um, based on, um, I'm a dancer and I, pra I practice yoga, I'm very athletic. Um, and my biggest fear was labor. I was so scared the whole pregnancy. Um, I was just so scared of, I did not always see good outcomes. Um, you know, moms and babies sometimes had really serious uh, complications uh, that weren't, the outcomes were not good. 
and a lot of intensive care nursery, you know, so I, I, ha I had gone into the whole thing with fear and I read and I took Lamaze, but um, you know, what fear does to fertility and inner sure. stress, right? So even an animal, if an animal is afraid, doesn't, doesn't labor well. So yeah. yes, I was given the royal treatment. I was the nurse on the unit that was having a baby. Right. But, but um, t it's just taking standard, you know, once you put the hospital down, you're di on, you're disempowered. You're kind of like, it gives you the feeling of being sick and dependent. You're giving sure. over your power to the hospital staff and the hospital and the doctor. And um, yeah, I put on my back um, with attached to a monitor that was, you know, monitoring every contraction, every uh, baby's, you know, every heartbeat of the baby yeah. and not allowed to eat and drink. So it's like, you know, it was a setup, right? And, and uh, it's like running the marathon. You can't run the marathon if you're not eating and drinking. So of course, you know, you have to have the IV for fluids, but that wasn't giving me nourishment. And the doctor kept coming in because I had to, I had to be dilating a centimeter an hour. They have time limits. And he kept like, without telling me, just sticking his hand up, up me and saying, you're still four. And, and walking out, you know, coming in again, you're still four. And I remember once he went out and he told the, um, uh, the nurse to hang pit. Now I know what pit means, it's Pitocin. And I, you know, so she comes in and puts, starts putting that in my IV. And I'm like, I don't want Pitocin because I was coping with things amazingly so at this point. And she says, but honey, you don't want a cesarean. Well, no, I didn't want a cesarean. So she kind of, you know, feared me into the whole, you know, so then the Pitocin and everything got more intense and, and, um, I could, my Lamaze went out the window yeah. and then I needed an epidural and, um, it's, 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 um, and then that's when her heart rate, uh, got seriously low and they called an emergency cesarean. So my biggest fear was happening and I was the center of it. You know, I was wheeled into a stretcher and it was this stat, you know, crisis. Um, and everyone's, you know, rushing and, you know, but then I'm in the operating room, all prepped and ready for surgery and nobody's coming in. And then I'm starting to look at the clock and it's an hour. It is an hour. They called it a, an emergency section, C-section. They were waiting for the assistant surgeon to come. Oh. Nobody was with me. Nobody was monitoring my baby. And I was literally in utter fear and convinced my baby was damaged or dead at this point, you know, because I, I knew how serious her heart rate was down. Right. And the epidural miraculously in that hour made me open, dilate, and I started pushing. And then- Without you know, anyone in the room? In the operating room. But without <laughs> anybody else in the room? Nobody, that they wouldn't let my husband in, you know. I, so, so then uh, I was like, help, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing, you know, and, and I said, the doctor comes running in and then it's like, crisis, get me the vacuum. And, and, and he, he gets um, the baby Hoover, we call it, which is the vacuum yeah. suction to suction her out yeah. and cuts a big episiotomy. And, and, and she is totally physically fine. She didn't right. think she was grieving, had a perfect heartbeat. I was not fine. I didn't want to see her. Like I thought she was not fine. And even when I saw her, I, you know, now what I know is I suffered from what is called birth trauma, which is, yeah. you know, it's PTSD, which is a normal response to being terrified of, yeah. you know, having you or your baby's life at risk. So, so um, when that happened to me um, and, and would you know, I, I said, I'm never having another baby. Of course, you know, two years later, I'm pregnant again on the same unit and had like a very similar scenario. And I remember, so this time I'm using a different doctor. And this time um, he, uh, when I went into labor, he stuck his hand up and he said, baby, he walked out, didn't talk to me. And this is a colleague of mine, you know, like we work together. He told the nurse, your baby's too high. Uh, her, her baby is too high in posterior, prep the, emerge, prep the operating room. And I'm like, whoa. So I had a little more uh, voice now, um, having worked on the unit and yeah. just I've given, so I, I called him back and I said, I, I didn't see, I didn't know midwifery, which we would have said, oh, your baby's high and, and, and facing the other way. Well, let's get up and go on our hands and knees. You know, like right. there's things we can do. I've seen so many babies that were high and posterior turn and come down, you know, so, but I didn't know that then, right? Um, there was no internet um, when I had my first two and,
I had the wisdom. And I did know I have given birth before. So I told him I have given birth before. I don't care what you need to do. <laughs> Turn the baby and, and uh, I can give birth, you know, vaginally. And he said, well, it's going to be agony. I said, I don't care. So he uh, stuck his hand way up inside and, and rotated her. Yes, it was agony, but I, I gave birth. And so after the, those two experiences, um, I was voicing my frustration with um, a, a friend of mine who was in midwifery school. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, why don't you be a midwife? <laughs> and I was like, what's that? Right. And, and uh, uh, she told me about it. And I d went to the library. No internet then. I did all the research I could. And it was like, it was just sort of a reclamation, like this makes so much sense. I came home and I applied to midwifery school and yes, I came home. You know, it, 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 it became, um, it was a whole different philosophy um, of care. I mean, it was a master's level training, but um, all these crises and, and emergencies and bad outcomes became way more the exception than the rule. And the humanity and the, and the beauty and the celebration was restored to the process of having a baby. The philosophy was women know how to uh, grow their baby. Women you know, know how to grow, birth, and breastfeed their baby, and babies know how to be born. And we need to get the head out of the way because our bodies know exactly how to do it. We've been doing it for thousands of years or else we wouldn't have survived as a species. Yeah. And it's normal till proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes, how can we you know, create this space so that a woman feels confident and empowered and, and can tap into the beauty and celebration of this whole experience? Yes, we know how to intervene um, if there's a problem. If there's but a need. If there's a need, you know, uh, we don't do surgery, but my cesarean section rates 5% compared to the national average of 30 or, or percent. Um, and in, in my neighborhood, actually, it could be 40 or 50%. It means um, of women, they're going in to have their baby or having cesarean, which is really uh, net mal malpractice, I, I think, you know. Yeah. So, so, so um, I, but, so I believed in the midwifery model of care. But then I'm pregnant now with my third baby, and, I, and now I'm going to a midwife. And I said to her, you know, I really believe in this, but I'm really scared because of what happened the last two times. So for me to really authentically promote this, it needs to work with me, right? And um, she's like, oh, <laughs> you'll be fine. Like, you'll see, you know. You'll, and and I, I really didn't viscerally believe her completely with all my heart and soul until I did it myself. And oh my gosh, that was the most healing experience. It was so, um, she really just created space. And um, the whole pregnancy and birth was a totally, it was empowering, it was beautiful. Um, and, and then I was, it was so healing because, because I gave birth on my own with, in, in, in the way that I was meant to. And um, I was like, now, wow, like now if I could do this, anyone can do this. So that, that's where my passion comes from, is, is preventing birth trauma, is restoring the humanity to the process, restoring women's confidence in their ability to birth, and giving them the back to power. Like here, these are these you know, things that we can talk about, uh, interventions that, or, or procedures that are possibly could be done to a pregnant woman, a woman and her baby. What do you want? You know, well, these are the pros and the cons. What do you want all along the way, right? Instead of, we're going to do this to you. Mm -hmm. So I went to a conference um, given by, it was, it was a big midwifery conference. And one of my favorite so, um, uh, lectures was by an obstetrician, Dr. Michelle O'Donnell. He's famous. Uh, he's French. And he kind of um, loves midwifery care and natural birth. And he overturned his whole... Um, this, this, this hospital that was very medicalized in France. And, you know, he was like, everyone was giving birth naturally, even breech babies and twins. And, 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 and he's become very famous and outspoken. He lives in, uh, practices in England. Um, he moved to practice in England. But anyway, he, he was at this conference. He said, what is the best intervention that a midwife can do at a birth? Well, this, this was a room of 350, 400 pre, uh, seasoned midwives mm -hmm. that have attended thousands of births and everyone was wrong, 
raising their hand and giving some suggestion. Everyone was wrong. Mm. And what would you think the answer was? B would be empowering the patient, empowering the woman. Right. So he said to knit. To knit. Why? To knit. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I, I, I'll tell like you why. A sweater. Yeah. It's a it's a wise, seasoned professional who's seen it all. And she is totally calm. She's exuding this calm. She's just knitting. And she's, her eyes are wide open. Her heart is wide open. Her ears are open. She can speak. But it keeps her hands from meddling. So the best intervention is no intervention. And right. it's to create that space that leave it alone. First, do no harm and allow it to happen. Yes, if something is, is the matter, she'll put things down and, and attend. But um, I thought it was, it was a brilliant um, uh, insight coming yeah. from an obstetrician. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, uh, for everyone um, listening, I, uh, I met Anne in August here in San Diego. And, uh, you know, I really connected with her, her passion for midwifery and, and natural birthing, but I've never heard these, I've never heard your story until today. And the thing that overcame me when I hear your story is, you know, you couldn't be the midwife you are today if you hadn't gone through those experiences. Oh, absolutely. Right. You know, totally. I mean, you know, a midwife who, who wakes up and says to herself, you know, I'm going to be a midwife because I think this is the right way to birth. That's profound and they're excellent, but they don't have that same sort of uh, contrast and experience to what you experience, not only as working as an, you know, a uh, uh, L&D nurse, but also experiencing yourself going through that as a patient delivering two children and then having your third Third and fourth. You know, third and fourth, sorry. That's third all right. Fourth. We, we didn't get into that one. Um, third and fourth, you know, naturally um, at home, right? No. So, Is so, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, uh, my, the name of my business is Home Sweet Home Birth, but I promote um, sort of this model of care, whether it's in the birth center, in the home, or in the hospital. Great. But, but, but the way to change the system, because this is going on, and, and actually yeah, there's a grassroots organization called Improving Birth, um, is uh, coined the term sort of obstetric violence that is going on in labor and delivery units across the country. The World Health Organization even speaks about we need to do something to prevent or, you know, and, and minimize what's going on. And um, um, I just lost my train of thought. I'm glad you have an editor. <laughs> what, what were you doing? It's, it's okay. No, no, it's fine. One second. One second. I, had a, I had a really good uh, point about preventing. Oh, anyway. We'll come back to it. What I was going to say with, um, with one of the other things that struck me in terms of what you were saying is I couldn't help but, but, um, but think about. Oh, I know what I'm saying. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, so I just wanted to finish, um, is, that, is that we can't, um, it's very hard to change um, obstetricians, to change hospitals, yep. large institutions, but the way we can really make changes is to give the, empower women and their families to, to, with information, you know, so they can speak up and create the kind of pregnancy and birth and postpartum experience, no matter where. And even this, this sort of empowering, compassionate, celebratory, you know, um, um, sort of home sweet home feeling wherever you are can still be, can be in the operating room. If a yeah. cesarean birth is needed, there's this what's called gentle cesarean, sure. you know, uh, um, women are still empowered with a, making decisions. They can actually, the drape is down. They can, they can glove and can receive their baby. Baby, uh, there's delayed cord clamping, baby's not suction, put right on to mom, you know, it's early skin to skin and breastfeeding. And she can have in the operating room whoever she wants. So, so it, cesarean birth, if needed, is still, um, it can be life-saving, but it's still sure. a birth. And right. it can be beautiful. Why not? Why does it have to be the sterile medical, you know, so, so um, you know, scary, 
scary procedure. So how can we restore yeah. humanity and dignity and empowerment of the woman in the most vulnerable situation of really being on her back, cut open with major abdominal surgery? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a big deal. You know, um, the we don't need to get into the politics of uh, birthing in the medical system here in the U.S. on on this uh, on this interview because that could be a long conversation. I'm sure you and I. Yeah, would. but a lot of obstetricians are so on board. They are, you know, um, the training. An obstetrician is a surgeon, right? Yeah. So if you want surgery, I mean, their specialty, and we need both, right? Their specialty is is looking for complications and disease and and treating them medically and surgery. That surgically, that's what they. That's their what they're training. Yeah. Is. If you're going to somebody like that, you 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 know most you likely have you're to going expect, to, yeah. have to expect that kind of care. But we need that because there are you know if someone you know most of us breathe right. We know how to breathe. Our body knows how to breathe. We're not thinking about it. Our heart knows how to pump. But if someone has heart disease, someone has asthma, right? So they need to seek care for that, right? So yeah. so so when when you have that team, it, um, uh, is that is in, in countries that have the best outcomes around the world, like um, best outcomes. Uh, for um, maternal and, and newborn health. Those are, those are countries, uh, a lot of them are in Europe, where the, everybody sees a midwife who's normal and healthy, and the yeah. obstetrician is really reserved for high-risk situations. Yeah. And, and when you have everybody, or, or the majority of people seeing an obstetrician, unfortunately, then you get this high use of intervention. Sure. And, and a lot of them are risky and surgery. And, and that is one of the reasons we are ranking among the bottom in terms of maternal and newborn um, illness and death around childbirth as compared to other developed countries around the world. Oh yeah, it's huge. I mean, one we have here in San Diego, we have, uh, I won't mention the hospital, we have a hospital that delivers the most cesarean births west of the Mississippi, mm. is here in San Diego. Wow. Which is, a, you know, it's, it would be a surprise. You'd think Los Angeles. Um, I mean, there's so many of the way, you know, in California, right? I mean, we're so yeah, aggressive and whatever, right? But we have one. Um, we also have some, you have a few uh, freestanding birth centers, right. Orange was, County and, and San Diego. Well. Yeah, so I was going to say, and then we also have on the flip side, a lot of freestanding birth centers, and we have um, a birth center that's part of the hospital system. That's part of uh, the, they have their own uh, department and, and floor in the, in the hospital, um, which is where my wife and I delivered. We delivered with, you know, we were under the care of midwives. And then Absolutely. if something goes wrong, you're just going down a floor, right? Or whatever. That's, right. that's what, um, that's a the, nice, that's a nice balance, nice balance. that gives you that flexibility. Should you need it? The national Institute of health care, uh, health and care excellence. It's, it's really, it's, it's UK's health regulator. Like we have the CDC and the NIH, yeah, yeah. right? So they, they, um, this was published in the wall street street journal when they came out with this very uh, bold statement, like based on the evidence, we, to improve outcome around birth, we need more midwife-led maternity units for sure. and out-of-hospital birthing f with midwives for, for low-risk healthy women. Well, once they, it, that, that is what the UK regulatory statement yeah, was. It does so many things. One is um, you get so much better care, in my opinion, by seeing a midwife throughout your, your pregnancy because they're spending this time with you. You also, it's in terms of cost, it's much less of a cost on the healthcare system to go that route on multiple levels. Um, and their first thought, like you mentioned, is not surgery. I was a, I'm a identical twin and I was born um, breech. And at the time, oh. yeah, at the time when I was, well, and this doesn't, like they don't train OBs to deliver breech presentation anymore it's they're restoring hard. that training to reduce would, the cesarean rate it'd be it's, great it's, right yeah. but they, there was this whole trend um because of c-section and risk and so much but um my mom didn't know she was having twins and i was the second one so she didn't Surprise know that was, twin yeah so she didn't know that i was coming and then they saw feet after my brother was born they turned me around and out i came <laughs> right like <laughs> You know, they just didn't, they don't do that today. Well, um, not, not as much. much. More, right. it, you as either, much. If you want a vaginal breach, breach or twin birth, you either need to go to a foreign trained obstetrician, midwives, midwives. or um, if, if they're allowed, 
Yeah. So, you know, depending on their where where they're working, um, and old school, like you know, an older, older obstetrician. That's what I'm. But getting. ACOG is calling for retraining the um, delivery of breech birth. It's a variation of normal. Um, some doctors in training. Great. I would uh, I would love to see it. Love to see it. Um, and so you know the things that I talk about with my patients now is much of what you've said, but the thing that always strikes me is this. Um, this fear and loss of, of control during a birth because you're in this circumstances and whether you can think clearly or not, now you're also, you've got, you've got several factors that I find that are, you know, taking place. One is you've got the, you know, the, the doctor in the white coat saying, no, this is what you're going to be or else this is the negative that's going to happen. Right. So obviously in that situation, you just want what's healthy for the baby. So you're more apt to give in. And then also when, when the mom is in this intention, they tend to ask um, mothers to uh, make decisions when they're in the peak of this discomfort, right? Like, how, just give me a minute so that I can think clearly, because how, how can I think in this moment of, of, of discomfort? And then you've got this husband who the last thing any husband wants to see their wife do is be in pain and discomfort. It's the last thing they want. Whatever I need to do to make her feel comfortable and have no pain, I'm signing up for. So when someone asks them to make a decision, right, and they're not strong enough with their information and education and knowledge of what as a team they want, they're more quick to jump towards intervention for that very reason, is the things that I see. Right. Well, that's why I, well, the, the work begins in pregnancy. Yeah, absolutely. So much of the work that I do with women is to restore their confidence in the process, to embrace, you know, um, all the sensations of labor as normal, right? As actually healthy, you know, and, and not to, um, we live in a culture that we want to like take away pain. Everybody's yeah. scared of pain and we want to take it away, but it's, it, or we think that pain is a, a sign that something's going wrong but it's actually pain is necessary for the pro for this huge major event of childbirth and can we invite the idea of embracing it and you know it's like it's kind of you know an attitude shift sure. right um michael jordan any major athlete any major dance performer a lot of time or, or a marathon runner running the 26 mile marathon right they things are hurting <laughs> they oh, are yeah. feeling discomfort but they have their eye on the goal, you know, or they have this knowledge that I'm going to rock this. You know, they asked Michael Jordan, how is it that you can at the, at the, at, you know, seven seconds left and you're down 10 points. How can you make three, um, three pointers and a layup and win the game on a buzzer beater? And his answer was, I knew I'd make the shots. You know, it's just, it's a shift. It's, it's all attitude. And, and yeah. they study the successful athletes and that's, it, it's, it's predominantly a mental mindset. So, um, shift. So, I use different language. I, um, I spend time in the whole pregnancy. We talk about all these possible interventions and, and that could possibly be done in the pregnancy, um, testing and procedures and in the birth so that they can make those decisions when they are not in labor, when they are not in the stress of it, right? Yeah. So they can write that down. You know, do I, do I want, do I want, do I not want, you know? There's, there's a list of 35, 50, you know, we can just go over everything. Do I, you know, who do I want there? What do I think about episiotomy? Do I want that? Do I not want it? Do I want to be able to eat and drink, move around freely? Do, or do I want an IV and be in a bed? You know, right. and, and, and so we go over all that. And, and, and then, you know, just the, the partner and, and, and the mom, you know, discussing that. And hopefully they come into an alignment, not only with each other, but with their provider. Because sure. sometimes the, they might find that the things that they are wanting are not necessarily what um, is in the kind of care, let's say, that they, are, uh, that, that they would get from such a provider. You know? yeah. and, then, and then there's a lot of um, ways to help a woman you know, um, restore her, her, her confidence in the process, to deal with fear, to deal with anxiety, and to really come at it is like, how can I love my experience? I've had women, uh, I've laughed their baby out, danced their baby out, 
um, sing their baby out and, you know, tell me they're in ecstasy with their pain. They're loving this experience. They're loving their birth. Yeah, it's challenging, sure. but, but they wouldn't want it any other way. And, it, and it's like when they get to the top, when they have their baby, there's this sense of, wow, I did that. That was like the hardest thing I, you know, ever that I did, but I did it on my own. And there's this, there's this, when everything is allowed to just happen on its own, there's this, um, uh, the beta endorphin, mean, there's, there's all sorts of hormonal shifts that, that cause this ecstasy. I've had women really tell me they are in ecstasy with their experience. They are so happy with it. They want to shout from the rooftops, oh, that's you know, funny. and, and that is so possible. How can we, how can we invite pleasure into the experience using all of our senses, you know, what, you know, into our life, but also into the experience. Like, what do we love to see? What inspires us? What movies, what, what pictures do we want to have? Do we want to watch or read? Um, and, and then in, you know, in the pregnancy and, and then in the birth, what do we want flowers there? Cause there's, there's a beautiful visual of a closed bud, right? And then it blossoms and opens like, it, like just, you know, that sometimes is an inspiring visual, visual. Um, women sometimes like to have, um, pic pictures of their family and, you know, mm -hmm. just to remind them that their mother did it, their grandmother did it, the great grandmother did it, their sister did it, you know, so whatever inspires that woman, you know, to see, and what does she want to hear? So I, t I you know, we discuss playlists, we, you know, what are, what's music that can help you tap into your calm, yeah. tap into, you know, into your, into your, um, into your center and then slow music, tapping into the sensual, it, you know, like the same kind of energy that gets the baby in is, 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 is very similar to the energy that gets the baby out. A woman needs to feel safe and private and undisturbed and, when a woman is tapping into her sensual and she's out of her left brain and she's more into her intuitive side. Um, so, you know, R and B soul music, anything that, that kind of, um, helps her get into her sensual and move the hips and so, you know, it, it just helps get the baby out awesome. and, um, some women, yeah. And, and, and then bring in the funk, like, like some shift the energy. Sometimes we need to create energy. So whether that's belly dancing or African or hip hop, you know, I mean, I, at three in the morning, once I remember there was a woman having a very slow labor. She had wanted a lot of people at her birth and it was, um, I think psychologically it was, um, she was probably feeling inhibited by having so many people. She was like a watched yeah. pot, right? And um, she felt like almost like she had to entertain everybody. And she, you know, it's, it's uh, some women birth very well having a lot of people around them, but she, it was impeding her. But I remember it was like three o'clock in the morning and, and everything, it was just a lonely energy. And we just started playing hip hop. And she was dancing, her husband was dancing, her mother, mother and father were dancing, the doula was dancing, my assistant was dancing, and we were just all like, bring it on. And it was such a beautiful scene, and it changed the whole, it created energy, and it just, you know, changed the whole, because using gravity and the pelvis is, yeah. is three bones connected by ligaments, you know, so moving the hips around, yeah. you know, it just helps the baby navigate down. It's great. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's listening. So People like to hear like running water, you know, that, yeah. a water garden, or they have a machine so they can hear a, 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 a running stream or ocean waves. You know, the waves is a very common um, uh, uh, word that women like to use for contraction because a contraction implies kind of a, a like tight. And mm -hmm. so, and it's not accurate because, because the top of the uterus is contracting so the bottom can open. And right. so maybe a more empowering word could be a wave. So yeah, a wave comes and comes around and then it goes to the top and then it goes down and then there's this rest and then comes another wave, right? right? So some women like to hear, you know, the waves just keep coming up and down. I had a woman that liked to use the word roller coaster. She wanted to have fun. So every time she had a contraction, it's like, oh, I'm going up, I'm going up, going up and then whoo, I'm going down. Like, like she was like, had such fun in her entire labor with that image of being on a roller coaster. So, so there's so much that we can play with, you know, and, you know, scents, you know, some women like certain essential oils. Some women don't want any scent. They're very sensitive to scent. They don't like bad breath. So everyone around them needs, you know, so I talk about this with everybody, like how can we, you know, please your senses and bring pleasure into the experience? Um, 
lavender or certain types of massage oils? How does a woman want to be touched? Does she like a firm touch, a soft touch? Does she not want any touch? And this might change when she's in the heat, heat of labor. What kind of material does she like to feel? Um, does she like to wear that will help her feel like this beautiful goddess? I mean, there's so many ways that we can make this the most beautiful peak life experience and reclaim it that it is because birth yeah. for thousands of years was a celebration um, in community. Well, it's, I mean, I love the way you talk about it. It's just beautiful. And I know for, for um, if anyone starts to work with you, this is the sort of experience that they get. So I know there's multiple ways that someone can work with you, right? I mean, obviously if they want to work with you specifically, they can do that, but you do have this, this program that people can be a part of. Um, it's called love your birth. Can you tell us and everyone who's watching a little bit about it so they can understand how this might support their pregnancy and birth? Right. So um, this online world is pretty amazing. So, so I, was, I was interviewed a couple of years ago by a podcast and the, the woman was in uh, San Francisco and she says, do you travel? <laughs> I, said, I said, actually, I do in select cases, you know, but, but she's because, uh, because um, she, her sister is in film and she just loves the way I bring people through pregnancy and birth and postpartum. And she wanted to know if, if, I, if I can't be the midwife for someone in the Philippines or someone in, in, in Iowa yeah. or someone in Kansas or Ottawa or around the world, right? Uh, could, could, could we create a course? Could I create a course that kind of takes women through and their, and their partners through my practice without the hands-on care? Right. So, so that they learn how to have a holistically healthy pregnancy, um, how to make decisions, um, you know, what are the pros and cons, like I said, of all the different types of procedures and testing, like, do I want genetic testing? Do I not? Um, not like, you know, just here's my body, do whatever you want. You know, you know it's restoring power back to this woman. Do I want the flu vaccine? Because mm -hmm. flu vaccine is given to all pregnant women, unless right. they decide that they're going to, you know, make a decision, informed not to decision. Get it. I get what? that question, uh, unless they're going to make the decision not to get it. I, that's the question. They just go, the doctor, they're just going to come in and give them yeah. a shot. Yeah. So, so knowing, I like women, everybody to know you have a choice. Um, doctor is not a policeman. Uh, the midwife is not a policewoman. The, the hospital is not a, a law enforcement center. So, so the, the me code of medical ethics is respecting a woman's autonomy to make decisions. You know, she knows an informed decision of course in an emergency that's a different situation but usually there's right so um yeah how to have a healthy uh you know what what to eat what to not eat what to drink what to not drink um you know toxins to avoid for the brain as well as for the body you know uh creating sort of like this fortress of positivity um creating a tribe, women, we need to restore the community because it takes a village to raise a mom yeah. and a dad and a baby. So a lot of women are alone. So how can we um, create that support around that, that woman for the whole pr uh, pregnancy and especially postpartum when she really needs it? Um, yeah. And, you know, preparing the partner and, 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 and helping her, them to prepare the mindset so they can embrace and not fear this, um, this, you know, whole process, and then, you know, how to, um, how to cope with labor, um, going through, uh, it's really just taking them through, uh, um, even how to prepare for postpartum, how to prepare for the support you need postpartum, taking care of the baby, breastfeeding, so, so I actually took her up on it, and I said, okay, and, 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 and we rented a cottage in Point Reyes, California, and she filmed, um, and her sister, you know, her sister was the editor and we created a course and um, I'm getting a lot of wonderful, amazing uh, testimonies from people all over the world and doctors are, are even recommending it as well as midwives around the world to, to their pregnant clients. I got um, a, an amazing testimony from a woman in um, South America, Central America, actually her husband was stationed there for work. And um, she said there were no midwives there. There were no doulas and, and she could find an obstetrician, but he only, they have a very high cesarean rate there and he only does cesareans. He, does, he, he doesn't do, not only he doesn't do natural birth, he doesn't do vaginal birth <laughs> unless they give birth in the car on the way to the hospital. Yeah. So she took my course and she was one in power goddess woman warrior. <laughs> she went and she said to him, I want a natural birth. 
And he's like, I don't, I don't really, you know, he is, but she, she um, persisted and she had the most beautiful natural birth he attended and it changed, it, it, it was beautiful for her, but it changed his, the way he practices, you know, Great. and just think of the ripple effect yeah. that that has for all the other women that come to him. It's fantastic. Know? Yeah, so it's, 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 it's a series of 10 videos, um, at least an hour long, and then there's a lot of da- there's downloads. And so it's basically like modules or sections, right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. That's fantastic. And, and then there's an option for like, you know, some women, um, they're very independent and they just like to take the course and that's fine. And then um, some really like to have, you know, check in with me each trimester. Mm-hmm. So that's the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, and then postpartum, um, the forgotten fourth trimester where there's so much right. huge changes. And a woman needs to remember that, you know, her, her, like throughout the world and throughout history, a woman is taken care of by everyone, the, all the women in the community, the mother, mother-in-law, sisters, friends, and um, she's off duty, like cleaning, yeah. housework, work responsibility out of the home. And, um, child care and, and, and shopping. And so that that's done by everybody else so that she can rest, recover and learn, get the breastfeeding going yeah. down. And what's going on in our country is we send women home four days after cesarean, two days after, after uh, vaginal birth. And then they're just kind of on their own and alone and scared, they're, you know, yeah. by, and, and uh, we, we're, we're seeing a lot more postpartum depression and, and, and yeah. postpartum illnesses. So I say, let's prevent that. And so, you know, I have like a, a whole postpartum plan. So, so I make myself available um, for these online, online Skype or Zoom consulting um, for, you know, so I have different types. Um, it, it, um, uh, it, once a trimester, for example, or sure, even just sure, once sure. Yeah, where they have the personal questions. Yeah, 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 personal questions, personal, personal issues. Or some women, like for example, they had a very traumatic, upsetting birth the first time. How can they heal? and prepare for a, you know, a much more positive experience the next time. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So if um, anyone who's watching wants to learn more about uh, this program, I'm going to put a link in the comment section or in the description below. And then also on my blog post for this, we'll put a link straight to your website um, so they can learn about you talk to you, engage with you, learn more about the program and, and all the ways that you can support women during their pregnancy and birth, which is, which is awesome. I'm also going to put a, a link um, because Anne gives a free download for resources um, and all the little tips and tools that she likes to recommend. Um, and it's a free download. I'll also put that in uh, a link to that in um, the blog post and the, the description for this as well for everyone to get and really, thank you so much for your time, your knowledge, your information. Um, I know I really enjoyed hearing your story because I hadn't heard it before, huh? um, but it really um, allowed me to understand more about you and, and kind of what brought you to this, to this work and how, how much you can help and support um, women and couples. So I, I really appreciate hearing that. Hopefully everybody else did as well, and they got a lot out of it. Um, again, if you guys want to reach out to Anne and learn more about her programs, all the links are below. Um, and if you've got any questions for either one of us, you can post it. Um, you can leave that below in the comment section, and then we will get back to that um, as soon as we can. Uh, Anne, once again, thank, thank you. you again for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, everybody else, thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Fertility TV. I really appreciate it. This was not about fertility specifically, but the extension of fertility into pregnancy. And hopefully you guys got a lot out of it. Um, If you want to learn more about all my upcoming uh, videos coming out every week, then um, follow me on YouTube. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. If you've got questions, leave them below. And if you want to know all my tips and tools for fertility and pregnancy and anything to support you on your journey and you want to get that every week in your inbox, then sign up for my newsletter, marksclar.com forward slash newsletter, and that will come straight to your inbox every Friday. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Until the next episode, see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Are you looking for a fertility coach? Are you looking for someone to guide you with your personal needs one-on-one? Well, that can be me. If you want more information on that, check it out right here.